Getting elections right. Um, this is a paper that derives from my PhD dissertation, um, so it might appear some, a bit basic in some parts. Um, what I did starting the PhD, uh, thinking I want to study election integrity, I want to study it in a comparative way, I want to find as much data as possible on elections in third and fourth wave democracies. So what I did is to pull together all the cross-national data sets that existed at that moment, or that I could find at least at that moment, and started comparing them. And this paper is sort of a, a result of that comparison. It provides an overview for people who want to work on election integrity of the, of the cross-national comparative data sets that are available. And I tried to compare them to see um, to what degree they validly and reliably measure election integrity. So I don't need to say this, elections are important, election integrity is important, everyone agrees on this. All, mo almost all states in the world now hold elections that meet formal criteria, but very strongly in their uh, practical quality. So this is why we need better measures to find out what's really going on. What is it, how to measure it? On what is it? A lot has been written, a lot has been done on conceptualization, even if the presentations this morning showed that still a lot of disagreement exists and still there is a need for better conceptualizations. I'll focus on how to measure it, but as you'll see, we'll come back to the question of what is it, because it influences, of course, uh, how the measures that we have. I follow an approach, I follow Adcock and Collier, and I follow uh, Verkuylen and Munch in, in my evaluation setup, looking at conceptualization, then operationalization, then measurement. And these are the standards of assessment that I use. So um, in terms of conceptualization, I won't go into the concept itself, but it does seem important that if we want to measure election integrity in a, in a valid way, concepts of election integrity should at least meet three criteria. The criteria by which we judge integrity have to be validly measured. We, we should be able to validly measure them. Criteria that we use should be cross-nationally comparable, at least if we want to do comparative research, not if you do within country research, obviously. And criteria need to be explicit. And as we'll see, many of the conceptualizations that exist uh, don't meet these requirements. Moving on to operationalization, what seems important is to at least try to measure election integrity with multiple indicators. I think we all agree on that in this room. Yet many of the existing across national data sets measure election integrity with a single score for a single election, judging whether it's extremely flawed, flawed or clean. Um, so we need to move on beyond that. And then in terms of measurement, I look at the selection of sources. Do data sets use multiple sources? What is the measurement level? Does it match? Uh, the measurement scales used, and uh, what is the organization of the coding process. I won't go into all of that, um, I'll just highlight the most important parts. In terms of conceptualizing election integrity, we see the strong difference between, I label them positive and negative concepts, it's not a very uh, a lucky term, I need to change that, but what it refers to is that some conceptualization of election integrity define election integrity by the criteria that elections should meet to be of high integrity, democratic elections, clean elections, free and fair elections, whereas negative concepts define norm violations that occur when uh, elections are less than fully integer. Um, this by itself is not a problem, but it, it does pose a problem when you want to validly measure uh, these concepts. So I'll come back to that later. The third distinction, is, or the second distinction, is whether they use universal or particular norms. We've had some discussion about this this morning. I would argue in favor of using universal criteria, again, for comparative purposes. And there's a difference between process and concept-based approaches, where concept-based approaches define a number of aspects that elections should have, like competitiveness or participation, whereas process-based approaches track the process of the election from before until after. I'll go into the first point, because it's the most important point. Um, What's the problem with negative concepts, as I call them, is that very often they emphasize intentionality and consequences for the outcome of the elections. And in terms, now, that is defendable if you're interested in election fraud. Uh, it's defendable from a point of view of conceptualization, but it is a problem if you want to measure it. Um, so what I argue in the paper is that we can't simply measure whether irregularities were intentional and even less can we measure to what degree they had an effect on the election outcome. So that's why I argue in favor of positive conceptualizations. 
um, moving away from concepts like electoral fraud, fraudulent election, like the quote you see here. Um, not because the concepts are bad, but, but because simply we can't measure intentionality and consequences for the outcome. We should measure election integrity by do irregularities occur and how frequently do they occur without this, this uh, further judgment. Well, here's an overview. I look at a broader set of concepts. I try to organize all the concepts I found in the literature. So if you look at the paper, it just gives a nice overview, I think, of the ways election integrity is conceptualized. And as you can see, most concepts are positive, in fact. Most concepts use universal criteria. And um, most approaches use a concept-based approach, whereas I think a combination would be preferable. Moving to operationalization, here actually the most important question is, uh, as you can see in, the, in, in this little table, of course, once we have data with multiple indicators, like the electoral in integrity project, like the expert data, then those later questions are going to become relevant. But at the moment, most cross-national data sets have just a single indicator, so the, I evaluated them on whether they have multiple indicators or not, measuring election integrity. This again is an overview of those data sets that have empirical data. So it's a subset of those concepts I presented earlier. And as you can see, f by far most data sets measure elections, giving them a single score, a qualitative score, based on a news media, based on academic reports, based on election observation mission reports. And it's only in recent years, starting with Sarah Birch's work, that we're starting, um, well, Jürgen Elglit gave a good example, but that was so elaborate that I think uh, many scholars didn't follow up on that for that reason. Um, but Sarah's data set and then the later data sets by uh, Hayden Marinov and, and, and Judith Kelly actually take up on this and start measuring election integrity more specifically with specific indicators. Then the last part, measurement, what sources do you use? We've talked about it, we've talked about partisanship, subjectivity. There are other biases that are important in terms of the sources that we use. How far back can we go in time? Do election observation missions, which we often use as a basis for our data, what do they tell us about the 1970s? What do they tell us about the 1980s? Um, observation missions had less well-developed methodologies at the time, so can we really use those sources to measure election integrity going that far back? Um, those are questions that our geographical coverage has been addressed as well. Yeah, I mentioned them. The most important one is multiple or single sources. To me, it seems that at least one way of cancelling out possible partisan bias is to use multiple sources. Most data sets use election observation missions. Most data sets use only those reports from missions that, are, that are, have well-developed methodologies like the EU or the OSCE. And yet, that's only one source. It has very limited geographical coverage. Uh, and there's a problem going further back in time. So I'd propose to measure it using multiple sources, at least. Um, this is, again, an overview of how the different data sets coded election integrity. What sources did they use? What scales did they use? Did they use multiple coders so that we can have at least some indication of reliability? So concluding, most cross-national data sets that we have now, note I didn't include the expert index, they conceptualize election integrity positively, they use universal criteria, so that's good, though only few combine this process and concept-based approach. Most cross-national data sets measure election integrity based on a single overarching indicator using a single source of information. Well, I think we all agree, uh, as the discussion has shown this morning, that this is, it's time to move away from that and to move towards data with, with specific indicators, mapping the entire electoral process. Um, and what criteria we should use those specific irregularities on is not yet that clear, so that's something more work can be done on. Just as a little afterthought, these are the data sets I compared empirically, I pulled them together, um, taking them as repeated measurements of a latent concept. Uh, so if we conceive of election integrity as a latent concept, very difficult to measure, those different data sets give us one measurement of what's going on in the elections. So I mapped them, pulled them together, and I tried to analyze this agreement between the different data sets as an indication of, uh, of error. What I find, well, I have over 700 elections, but these are the elections that are coded twice. 
the entire data set includes 100 countries from third and fourth wave regimes from 1974 to 2009. Those are the overlapping elections. I find that 40% have very strong disagreement, meaning disagreement not due to the use of different coding skills. I find the disagreement is lower if data sets measure only the presence or the frequencies of irregularities. So those data sets that include judgments about whether the irregularities were intentional or whether they affected the election outcome, whenever they are included in the measurement of elections, disagreement is much higher. I also find that if we only include data based on single indicators, disagreement is much higher. Of course, it's logical. One judgment is much less precise than when you measure multiple indicators. Then finally, and this is something maybe to think about when we develop new data on election integrity, is that I also find disagreement to be higher in elections that are of lower integrity in post-conflict elections and in former Soviet republics. And I'd like to highlight that last point because I think um, what we know about former Soviet republics is that most of the manipulation of the electoral process takes place far before the elections. And this clearly shows that the current data we have doesn't manage to tap that part of uh, the electoral process. And yet it is very important for election integrity. So lots of work ahead. Thank you very much.